Chapter 7, Impulse and Momentum. So up to this point, we've taken a look at forces, but we've considered that they're constant for all of time, or at least all of the interest of the problem, right? Maybe it's when you're driving a car around a turn, and we're going to assume the force is constant for that entire turn. But in reality, a lot of forces are only applied for a short amount of time, such as a baseball striking a bat or the bat striking the ball, depending on your perspective, right? The, the bat is only in contact with the ball for a short amount of time. And in this case, the force the bat applies is not constant, right? I, I don't have a baseball bat, but we can imagine my ruler's a bat and the tennis ball is a baseball. And when they first make contact, they're barely touching each other, right? For a brief nanosecond, we're talking tiny scale here. And so there's basically no force from the bat to the ball. But then as the bat continues to swing through, it applies more and more force to the ball until the ball goes from having a velocity going one way to actually taking the velocity and going the other way. But if we looked at the force over time, like if our bat had a force sensor on it, we'd see that the force goes from zero to a very small value, shoots up to a maximum value, and then decreases again as the ball starts to move away from the bat. This is something, if you look at uh, slow-mo captures of it, you'll see the baseball actually flattens against the bat. It's quite dramatic. This happens even with golf balls, right, which seems so hard. If you look at the slow-motion video, the ball flattens out when, when the bat or the club is exerting the largest force on it, and then it springs off of the club. So the force there is not constant, and that's a little bit harder to work with. Rather than trying to work with this weird curvy function, right, which we could come up with some equation for that, but it would be a bit involved and every force would be slightly different. We can instead focus on this blue line, which is the average force applied during this time interval, from the initial time to the final time. So notice it's not as large as the largest amount of force, but it's more than the smallest amount. And this would be if instead of the force having this variable nature, if it was constant for that time interval, this would come out to the same effect. And so this allows us uh, to help describe this. We define something new called impulse. So impulse, or the impulse of a force, is the product of the average force and the time interval during which that force acts. And we call the impulse J. And then we have average force as the bar over it to show that that is average, it's non instantaneous, times delta T, the time interval. Note that both the force and the impulse have arrows on top, so these are vector quantities. And so the impulse has the same direction as the average force. So with the bat striking the ball, since the force on the ball is going that way, the impulse is going that way too. The units of impulse are just that of force times time, or newtons times seconds. So with this in mind, we could go back to our baseball analogy, right, and say that, okay, we're going to describe the impulse that the bat makes on this ball. So the bat is applying an average force over a time interval. And notice that average force that the bat applies is enough to change the velocity of the ball from going one way to very much going the other way with a different uh, speed as well. So we want to connect our ideas of impulse to speed. Another thing to think about here is if you have, say, the same speed of pitch, the same batter, the same bat, you're going to get a very different final velocity if it's instead a softball compared to a baseball. Why would it be different? Well, a softball is a lot bigger and it has more mass. So that's going to be something we need to bring into the picture. Because we want to know how the velocity will change, right? This is something uh, in the major leagues of baseball 
they care very much about how fast they can hit the ball because that's going to determine how far they're able to hit if they're hitting a home run or not. So we're going to do a little bit of a derivation here, but it's pretty short. So if we go back to Newton's second law, our favorite equation, F equals MA, as you see, it just keeps popping up. We're going to work with the average force is equal to the mass times the average acceleration. And our definition of the average acceleration is the change in velocity, the final mass, the initial, over time. All of these are vector quantities. We are paying attention to the directions. So we can plug that in, the definition of acceleration, into that. And then we have mass times velocity final minus mass times velocity initial divided by delta t is equal to the net, that, the net average force. Now, if we multiply the delta t across, notice on the left side here, this is looking a lot like our impulse, right? It's the average force times the time interval. That's our impulse. On the right, we have the final velocity and the initial velocity, which is good because that's part of what we're interested in figuring out more about. And we also have the mass, which as I mentioned, mass will make a difference in how fast it's going, the ball is able to travel after being hit by the bat. So we're going to take a moment before we get to a final conclusion to define what is this quantity of mass times velocity. We're going to give it its own name because it does pop up a lot. So this is going to be called linear momentum. We're going to also see angular momentum later on. So the linear version is just traveling in straight line paths, not in a circle or spinning. So the linear momentum of an object is the product of the object's mass times its velocity. This is a really handy equation to note. So we use a lowercase p for linear momentum. This is different than a rho or a capital P for pressure. We have a lot of overlap with all the different symbols. So note this is a lowercase p. The way that I like to draw it is I like to include a little stem over the top and then a flat bar on the bottom, just to make it extra clear that it's a lowercase p. So that for me is different than my uppercase p, which would look something more like this. But we're not worried about uppercase here. There we go. OK. So another thing to note is this is a vector quantity, right? We have vector symbols over the momentum as well as the velocity. And because we have vectors over both, the linear momentum has the same direction as the velocity. So if the velocity is going one way, the linear momentum is going that way too. What are the units of linear momentum? Well, we don't have any fancy units for them. It's just going to be a combination of what we have here, mass times velocity. So mass is in units of kilograms times our units of velocity, meters per second. Right. So now that we've defined this thing called momentum, which we will see later on is a really powerful concept and useful for approaching a lot of different scenarios, we can go back to that equation that had impulse and see how this all ties together. So the impulse momentum theorem says that if we have a net force acting on an object over some time interval, the impulse of this force, the force times the time interval, is equal to the change in the momentum of the object, right? M, m times velocity final minus m times velocity initial. Instead of writing out that out every time, we can write that as momentum final minus momentum initial. And I didn't have an easy way to make vector symbols, but I bolded them to represent the vectors. And I'll add those in just so you make sure to have those. So this says, whatever your impulse is, that describes how the momentum can change. So if the baseball bat doesn't apply a net force on the baseball, that momentum of the ball is not going to change. It's going to keep traveling in that original velocity direction. We have to be able to apply a force in order to change it, right? Either to slow it down slightly at least, or to even change the, the velocity of the ball and the momentum of the ball so that it goes in the opposite direction. This incidentally also shows uh, another reason why 
They encourage players to swing through. One, if you try and stop yourself, you're going to slow down your motion and cut yourself short. But two, if you're swinging through, you're maximizing the time that the bat is in contact with that ball. So the more time you have in contact with the ball, the more impulse you're giving to that ball, the more you can change its velocity so that it is able to travel faster, which is usually the goal. Right, so this introduces the idea we're going to see a lot more with momentum to come. So that is coming. But first, let's take a look at an example. So an example of a rainstorm. Rain comes down with a velocity of negative 15 meters per second and hits the roof of a car. The mass of rain per second that strikes the roof of the car is 0 0.060 kilograms per second. Assuming that rain comes to rest upon striking the car, find the average force exerted by rain on the roof. Right, so we have these raindrops that are coming down and striking the top of our car. And it mentions that the rain comes to rest. So it just turns into a little puddle here. And we could say V is equal to zero. And that's going to be our V final specifically. There we go. Right. And there's some other speed beforehand that's going to be our V initial. Ah, it tells us that comes down with a velocity of negative 15 meters per second. V0 is negative 15 meters per second. So that's a great thing to write down is what we know. They also give us this 0 0.060 kilograms per second. 0 0.060 kilograms per second. So what do we think this corresponds to? Kind of a mysterious quantity, but the units can give us a clue. It says kilograms per second. So what has units of kilograms? Well, for units of kilograms, we have mass. What about units of seconds? That's our time. So this is our mass per unit time is equal to 0 0.060 seconds, kilograms per second. And that's what they try and say in this statement up here. The mass of rain per second. So mass per second is going to be mass per unit time. All right, so this is looking pretty good so far. What are we trying to solve for though? What do we want to know? So it's to find the average force exerted by rain on the roof. So we're looking for the average force of rain on the roof. All right, so as we're thinking about this, we can think about what tools do we have? We just got one, that impulse momentum theorem, right? That the impulse is equal to the change in momentum. So our impulse, well, I'll just rewrite it. Impulse equals change in momentum, delta P. Awesome. So our impulse is the force times the time interval, right? And it's really the average force there. There's a vector. And that's equal to m v final minus m v initial. Now we don't really know our mass here. So this could be worrisome, except for that we know the mass over the time. And we have time on the left side. So notice if we want to solve for the force, we could just divide both sides by this time interval. And then we can distribute that division by a time so that it's just applying to the mass. And this starts to become much much better looking. 
So our force, average force, is equal to our mass over our delta T times our V final. Uh, minus mass times the initial the mass is divided by delta t and we know the mass over time and we know the final velocity and the initial velocity so at this point we are in really good shape right so let, let's check ahead to what they have for the final solutions all right so sure enough they solve for that the final velocity is zero. And so we just get that the force is negative, the mass over the time interval times the initial velocity. So we have a negative times this point zero six zero kilograms per second times negative 15 meters per second. The velocity is a vector. So we have to include that negative sign that says that the velocity is going down initially. And this comes out to positive 0 0.90 newtons. Now, why is the force positive? I'm glad you asked. It's positive because over here, this is the force on the raindrop due to the roof, right? So what the raindrop feels from the roof is an upward force. It's gonna, it's like running into the wall. That's why it's in the positive direction. Now, this describes neglecting the weight of the raindrops that the net force on the raindrop is simply the force due to the roof. That's not really relevant to this problem because it already said to just focus on the force from the roof, uh, but you could calculate the weight of the raindrop as another force acting on the raindrop. It just ends up being tiny compared to this, right? Because uh, a single raindrop is like 0 0.03 grams. So if you should convert to kilograms, and multiply it by 9.8 to get the weight, you get something even smaller. It's like 0 0.0003 newtons. So it's much, much smaller than this, which is one reason why you can say, yeah, we could neglect the weight of it, even though we don't have to for this problem because it already specified what we're solving for. All right, so with this in mind, let's take a look at a conceptual example. Conceptual example here says hailstones versus raindrops. Instead of rain, suppose hail is falling. Unlike rain, hail usually bounces off the roof of the car. If hail fell instead of rain, would the force be smaller than, equal to, or greater than that calculated in the previous example? So I want you to think about this, choose one of the answers before you move on, including a reason why, and then move on. So go ahead and pause the video now. All right, did you do that? Okay, well, let's think about this. With the raindrop, the final velocity is zero. With the hailstone, it says that it bounces in the other direction. So we have a velocity that now is not zero. It's a non-zero value. It might be closer in magnitude to the speed of the initial velocity, but it's in the opposite direction. So this is a much greater change in velocity to go from going one way to going the other way. So what we're going to see is that this one has a much greater force in the case of hail than rain. And you could show that mathematically. You can make up some numbers here. That's often a good strategy. Say that the initial velocity is two and the final negative two, the final velocity is positive one. And so then you would find if you do final minus initial, that comes out to three meters per second. Uh, times whatever the mass is. Versus with uh, the coming to rest, you would just find a change in velocity of 2m. So that's something I encourage you to give it a shot. The other way is you can think about it. And if you think about going out when there's hail, it's a little bit scary because hail hurts. Because why? Well, hail is hard. When it's that hard, because it's bouncing, your head is exerting a larger force on it, as is it exerting a larger force on your head. So that change in momentum of it coming down and then bouncing up off your head or whatever else is going to be 
a more painful force, something that you definitely feel. Right, so we'll wrap up there, but this introduces the impulse momentum theorem.